right. Um, I, I want to say good morning to everybody and thank you for joining us today. It's great to see everyone. I'm Lisa McNaughton. I'm uh, the Director of Retirement Services here at Atlas. And I'm joined, as Lenny mentioned, with my colleague and Associate Wealth Management Advisor, Suzanne Bizak. And uh, so it's the last day of March. We reached the last day of Women's History Month 2022. And uh, I, I don't know about you, but there's been a lot of great and interesting information I've seen all month, and hopefully you have too. And uh, one of my particularly favorite ones, if you're a fan of college basketball, you know, maybe you've seen uh, the ad campaign that Buick has been doing that's been highlighting throughout the basketball tournament, great moments in women's sports that were never seen on TV with a promise of, of trying to change that. So uh, today we're going to continue with, uh, with the conversation about women. And I'm so happy and excited to introduce Susan Kay, the Director of Business Development at MFS Investment Management, who will be speaking with us today. Susan is going to help us understand how some of the caregiving that women do in their lives can have a significant impact to their retirement plans and sometimes also their immediate financial landscape. With more than 30 years of experience in the financial services industry, Susan is very frequently invited to speak on a variety of topics that range from building and protected, protecting excuse me, accumulated wealth to handling the challenges presented by estate planning issues such as caring for aging parents, teaching families about philanthropy, and legacy planning. She has a track record of successfully translating complex concepts into everyday terms. So Susan, we're very excited to turn it over to you. That's terrific. Thank you guys so much. I'm excited to be here with everybody today. I'm gonna to load up some visual aids, some terrific slides for everybody so they can track where I'm going. Bear with me. There we go. Uh, but I'm, I'm proud to be a member of this panel. I mean, the women in this group are amazing. And today, what I'm going to do is share with you a broad range of concepts and ideas that will help you tweak the wonderful retirement plan that you have already, in fact, put in place. So I'm going to start with my own personal money story, because I think all of us have one. And one of the things I want to encourage each and every one of you to do is know, know what your money story is. Now, I proudly grew up one of the very one of the daughters of one of the very first women's libbers in this country. So let me give you a little perspective on what that means as a kid. First, she was a woman of the early 60s. So remember, peace, love, drug, sex, war, and rock and roll. And even though she got a 4.0 GPA at Stanford University, the only jobs available to her really were secretary, nurse, and teacher. So when she had two girls, she preached to us that we needed to be self-sufficient. We needed to, how to know how to take care of ourselves. So when I was old enough to work at about 15 and a half, she took her hand, she put it in the small of my back and pushed. So I went out and I developed a summer job and I taught swimming lessons in my neighbor's pool. Here's my first money lesson. I made $1,500 that summer, which was a fortune. And what I did, I bought my very first car, a 1964 Chevy with a metal dashboard that would kill you if you hit it. But that was my first understanding of earning money and understanding what it could do for you. My second lesson actually came at the age of 17 when I was going off to college. And my father became unemployed because it was the housing crisis and he was a builder. And he said to me, Sue babe, I need you to continue to work while you're in college to make that spending money, which I said, no problem, dad. So I took in a lot of sewing. I was a typesetter for a newspaper. I was a housekeeper for a year. And about midway through sophomore year, he came back at me and he said, I've gotten the career opportunity of a lifetime. You don't need to work anymore. However, I want you to give 10% of what you have made every year to families, organizations, charities, that are less fortunate than our family has been. And that was my second lesson about money and not only what it can do for yourself, but the importance of what it can do for others. So I am thrilled to be here with all of you today to share with you what I've learned in my 30 year career in helping women and families have definable success in building really great retirement plans. With that said, we're going to do a little retrospective on you, not me, 
but on you. Let's take a look at some of the great books that have been written in our lifetimes. The first tomb that I ever read about women and women's strength and our independence is this one, Our Bodies, Ourselves. And it was awesome because it was my mother's favorite book. So as a small child, like 10 years old, I, I wanted to touch it. I wanted to read it. I wanted to understand it. It was my, my very first introduction into women's strength. The second book, of course, was Gloria Steinem's Steinem, which really talked to all of us as a gender about our independence and our abilities and our capabilities. Later on came Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique. After that came Susan Faludi at the age of 32. She published a bestseller called Backlash and it talked about wage differentiation for women in the early 80s. And then lastly, during our lifetimes right now is Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In. And what's great about this particular book during our time is she simply reminds us to change the dynamic, change the roles, and take on challenges to win because there's no reason why we can't at everything that we do. So today, what we're going to do is take on every challenge and we're going to master it. We're going to talk today about the three areas where you need to actually have definable wisdom in managing your wealth and your retirement plan. And they are number one, understanding your parents' financial needs, particularly before they surprise you. Number two, how to create financially capable kids, whether they're 10 or 40. And then number three, understanding what could happen to you, or I'll say to women of a certain age. And so what we're gonna to learn today is that it's not always the classical financial risks that we need to be prepared for, but those life events that can actually impact the wonderful retirement plan that we've already built. So I've broken this down into three parts. And what we're gonna do is talk about A, aging parents, B, kids, whether they're again, 10 or 60, and then C, we'll talk about you. All right, let's get started with the surprises that aging parents can bring us. Caring for aging parents, as some of you may know, takes tremendous planning and forethought and care. 40 million Americans care for an aging parent and 70% of that group are female. Now the effect on women is multifaceted. The research shows that the emotional strain of making tough decisions wears us down. The financial strain of uncovering what our parents don't have can be crucifying. And the loss of time, our own rhythm, a precious commodity that we're all trying to figure out is another challenge that we take on, that elusive balance in life. And what does that look like? Well, what I'd like to do is I'd love to give you some really great tools that I have found to be incredibly helpful in caring for aging parents. I was chatting before with some of these wonderful women on the panel today, and I said, oh my gosh, my 89-year-old mother is calling me one minute before I start. She likes to FaceTime every morning, which is great. But for a working woman, I had to adapt. I had to slow down and accommodate that. So let's start by talking about some of the great tools I can share with you. Number one, I hope you have a pen because it's going to be like drinking water from a fire hose. Number one, there's a wonderful, wonderful book available to you, and it's called How to Say It to Seniors, and it's written by David Solly. It looks like this, How to Say It to Seniors by David Solly. And what I love about the book is he teaches us and gives us choices on wordsmithing. Let me give you an example. How do you have a conversation with your parents about, golly gosh, I need you to stop driving. <laughs> You're a danger to yourself and to everyone else. But there's better ways to say it than, than like that, or to simply say, give me your car keys. So the first chapter, they spend a lot of time helping you wordsmith how to have that conversation with an aging parent. Another thing they talk about is memory failure and how to not be rude to our parents as we watch their memories begin to, to fail? How do we adapt to that? And what kinds of phraseology do we use with our parents to actually recognize that conversation between the two of us? Handling the repetition of thoughts is tough for us. My mother repeats herself all the time. 
So how do you handle that? And again, understanding they're trying to emphasize something that's important to them. Having the conversation about when to move into a nursing home, that's really hard. And they give you like five pieces of scripting. You get to read through them, pick the one that suits your personality and then have the conversation. Um, so that's a wonderful book. I can't recommend it enough. How to say it to seniors. Another great book is called Another Country. And I've probably been talking about this book for 15 years because it's really good. It's called Another Country by Mary Pfeiffer, P-I-P-H-E-R. And what she does is she talks about navigating the terrain of having an aging parent and specifically addresses that very slow dementia loss, not Alzheimer's, but just the slow loss of capacity and capability. I have had everyone in my family read that book because at the time when I first read it, I had four aging Americans, my parents and my husband's parents. And my husband would get very frustrated when his mom would repeat herself. And I finally said to him, you need to read this book. And you need to understand that the reason the book is called Another Country is because your mother has moved to another country. And if you wanna be with her and you wanna visit her, you visit her there. She's not coming back to where you are. And I will tell you that cleared up so much angst and anxiety and bad conversations. It was amazing. Another wonderful tool that you've got and that your advisors have in their practice is a checklist that's called Aging with Dignity Checklist. And what it is, is you take this tool, there's 10 line items or check boxes on it of things that you need to get answers to, but you can start at the top of this list and the questions and conversations you wanna have with your parents are easy. So as an example, have you thought about mom and dad about leaving your home? What are you gonna do with Bowser? And so it's an easy conversation. You're not asking them when you're moving into a nursing home. You're saying, have you thought about what are you going to do with the dog? So it's a gentler way to get into that. Another one I like, have you thought of, and it has to do with driving and car keys. Have you thought about transportation options if you give up driving? I think it's very kindly worded, if you give up driving. So let them talk about what their vision is, what they think that's going to look like. So the Aging with Dignity checklist gives you, again, another 10 pieces of wordsmithing on tough subject matter. So take advantage of that. Learn more about where your parents are. Another great tool for you is in simply caretaking your, of your aging parents. There is a, a wonderful website that your advisors can take advantage of, caringinfo.com. They have all of the healthcare directives for every state in the United States. So what you want to do is make sure that you've got your parents' healthcare directives on your cell phone. And if you're the parent in my audience, you wanna make sure that your kids have it on their cell phone. And a great way to take care of that is in the Evernote app, it's free. Let me give you an example of a real life story. So I live out in the country, my father, my parents live 20 minutes away by car. One of the things my dad used to love to do was ride his bike over to my house, which I loved. My office right now is at the end of my driveway. So I could see him coming down my driveway and it would be delightful. I'd jump up from my desk and we'd go out and have a cup of tea. One day I see my dad walking down my driveway and that's odd. So I give it literally what I like to call golden retriever head tilt. What's wrong with this picture? And what I see is he's got his bicycle in his hand and in his left hand, he's got his front tire and his front tire is folded over like a fortune cookie. And I'm confused by that. And as he gets closer to me, I can now see that he's bleeding and he's bleeding from his head and his shoulder and his leg. So I jump out of my chair and I go running out the door and I go, dad, dad, dad. And when he sees me, he literally lets go everything and just hits the ground and i finally figure out and i learn from him he was hit by a car that decided not to stop i'm telling this story because it makes you feel completely powerless 
to protect the people that you love, especially your aging American families. I'm telling this story to an advisor not three months later, and they gave me the best idea ever, and that is this app, Evernote. You put it on your phone or your adult children's phone, you take the healthcare directive of your parents, and you simply drag and drop. Initially, you can put it on your laptop, and that way it's easier to drag and drop, and it'll automatically upload to your phone. So I am now able, if one of my parents goes into a hospital, I can call that hospital from afar and I can talk and get answers and qu to questions, right? If I'm not near them, they don't know who I am. The first question they're going to ask is, do you have a healthcare directive? And I can say, yeah, let me email it to you. And I can tap it right into my phone. I can send it and I can solve problems. Empower yourselves to take care of less capable, we'll call it that, family members. Getting the app, as I mentioned, it's free, putting the healthcare directive in it, carrying it around with you at all times. So I love that tool. Lisa, you have helped many client families with aging parents and the demands that can be placed on adult children like ourselves. What kinds of tools and resources do you like to use to make the path easier for both members of the family, both gens? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, as investment advisors, obviously our, our focus is oftentimes money. So we, we regularly are help, helping clients figure out the best way to pay for the additional costs associated with care. You know, you had mentioned, what are we going to do about transportation if you're not driving anymore? All that, you know, many times comes with a cost. So, you know, evaluating which assets they have which assets makes the most sense to use from an income tax perspective or an opportunity cost perspective. And, and as important or more importantly, we've developed relationships with other professionals in this health, uh, you know, aging arena, attorneys that specialize in elder care and Medicaid planning, and then other professionals that work in the health insurance arena. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, some of the statistics. I remember when I was one of those 40 million uh, caregivers, right, as the adult female in my, fa in my family, the female child. And it, it was overwhelming, the complexity of the paperwork and the transition of moving my mom from Florida to New York. And, oh, you know, it was living accommodations and Medicaid planning and uh, health care powers of attorney. I didn't have Evernote. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, the worst for me was the health insurance claims. And I, I can't tell you how many times I said to my brother and my husband, like, I don't know what people do if they don't have a, a child to help. But I right. think, you know, if, if you don't, you can build a good advisory team to help you. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Having, you know, uh, Lisa, your comments are so right on. I just lived, did go through this with my father who passed away last year, and it was completely overwhelming because first we dealt with all the insurance stuff that had to be accommodated to your point and then all the estate stuff and i will tell you that you know i live in california and my financial advisor saved me literally kept my head above water the whole time mm. we're going to pivot for just a minute and we're going to talk about our children and how do we raise financially fit kids again whether they're young or whether they're already in their 40s i'm going to give you lots of ideas so again Keep your pen in your hand. Number one, I am going to start with, you know, I get asked all the time, Susan, what do you think makes financially fit kids? And what I would tell you is it's transparency. The more transparent you can be, the better your kids will learn from you about how are money decisions made, how is budgeting made, how... How do you make investment decisions? They need to hear the vocabulary starting at a really young age. So kids learn by example. So be the example and be as transparent as you can. Let's start with some great tools for you in terms of kids. Uh, number one, there's a wonderful book out that's called Raising Financially Fit Kids. It's good for ages eight through 18. And what it covers in this book is all the different things that a parent or a grandparent can do with kids in that age range. So in other words, it helps a parent teach a child the actual value 
of an earned dollar. And that's something I spoke to you about when I was growing up and I was trying to, not, not trying, but I was forced into learning the value of an earned dollar and what it can do for you. So it's a wonderful book with lots of activities and ideas in it that'll help that conversation. The second book I like is kind of ratcheting up the age range. It's for like 13 to 18. And it's called The Official Money Guide for Teenagers. The Official Money Guide for Teenagers is a great 13 page colorful kind of workbook that teaches kids words and vocabulary, right? If you've got teenagers in your family, they need to start to learn what's the difference between saving, investing, spending, donating. What's, what's a budget? What's debt? right? What's an investment? What are some of these words that they need to start learning at a younger age? If we wait till they get out of college, it's not that it's too late. It's just so much harder. So that's a great book. The next book is for the kid who is graduating from college, the 21 year old, and it's called First Job, First Paycheck. And it's fantastic because the first lesson out of the gates that it teaches is, hey, kid, when you get your first paycheck and it's 33% less than you thought it would be, here's why. Because honestly, when kids get their first paycheck, they're a little confused why they're short. <laughs> so it starts there and then moves into budgeting when you've got your first job, first paycheck. And then the next book I really, I've loved for years. And it's really for like 25, 30 year olds to 40, 45 year olds. And it's called Simple Wealth comma, inevitable wealth. And what's great about this particular book is it does help those in that age range be better about not overspending and not using a credit card, understanding how to save for a house and a college tuition and paying down debt all at the same time. And it has very clear, articulate, easy to understand explanations of all of those things. So those are some great tools I wanna to share with you, but a couple of other tools to interact with the next generation that are um, you know, equally powerful are, what have I got? Six ideas. Number one, bring your children in for an annual review with your advisory team, if not every year, then every other year. One of the greatest failures we have in this country is the transfer of wealth to the next generation. When we die and we transfer wealth to our kids, 70% of the time those assets are depleted within that generation and 50% of the time it's in the first 10 years. And the reason for that is, is kids have no experience managing wealth or having conversations about wealth because they haven't accumulated it yet. So one of the greatest things you can do is bring your kids in, again, I don't care if they're 10 or 40, and let them start to have the vocabulary kind of shower over them. If you don't want to disclose your assets, that's totally fine. Your advisory team knows how to talk about money, investing, and making decisions without actually revealing assets. And that will enable our kids to grow and to be better and just simply more capable when the time comes. So that's number one. Number two is a website that I love called Money Savvy Generation. Money Savvy generation. Actually, it's not generation. They just call it moneysavvy.com. My bad. Moneysavvy.com. And on this website, it is filled with all kinds of tools for kids of different age ranges. So let me give you an example. You can pull down the tab for young kids under the age of eight, and they've got one of those gigantic piggy banks, you know, that has it pre-divided into spending, saving, investing, donating. So again, right out of the gate, we teach our children that money has multiple purposes, right? Um, but it also has other things like DVDs and coloring books and that kind of thing. You pull down the next tab and it's for kids who are, you know, more like 10, 11, 12, maybe they're getting their first allowance. So I will ask you, I can't see you, but I'll ask you to raise your hand anyway, because it's fun to participate. How many of you, when you grew up, had a savings passbook? I did, right? Yep, me and Lisa. One of the things you can do on this website that's awesome is you can, for like $5.50, you can buy a savings passbook. It doesn't actually have to be tied to a savings account because we're talking about children, young children getting their first allowance. 
But the thing that's so powerful about this, this $5.50 expense, when you start to give that child or that grandchild an allowance, you give them the passbook and you say, you write down, I give you whatever going rate is, $10 a week. I want you to write it down in the passbook. And then when you spend any money, I don't care if it's on a candy bar, you write it down in the passbook. And at the end of the month, we'll take a look at what you've spent and what you saved. You're teaching your child about budgeting in the most easy, but most importantly, the most tangible way. Because there is something about the art of writing these things down that helps us remember things. So I love that particular tool. And then if you move into the third section, they have one of my all time favorite tools and I used it on all three of my girls and it's a college budget workbook. I don't know how many of you have sent kids off to college, but I personally found one of the greatest challenges was how much spending money do I give them for pizza and beer? <laughs> I don't know. Off they go. And I know they need pocket money, but I, I don't know. So what the workbook does, again, is you say to your kids, here's the college budget workbook. I'm going to give you 150 bucks a month. I'm going to drop it right into your account, but I need you to write down everything you spend. And when you come home in December, let's go through it so I can learn more about what you need and where the money's going. Imagine for just a moment that this child does a college budget workbook for all four years of college, how strong are they gonna be when they graduate and get their first job? Wicked strong, really. They will already have learned about budgeting, which is fantastic. All right, another great tool that I love is this piece that you can get from Suzanne and Lisa. It's called Philanthropic Giving Made Easy. And what's so great about it is, is you can take a couple of these worksheets and you can scribble all over them. Where do you like to make donations? What's important to you? Do you like to make them globally? Do you like to make them locally? What's your drivers? And on the far right hand column, it actually asks you, you know, if you were to get hit by a bus tomorrow, who do you want to be remembered by? You fill that sheet out. Now, what's so powerful is you can actually have a conversation with your kids, again, regardless of age, 10 to 40, 10 to 60, I don't care, about what your family's donations look like. And more importantly, why you make donations to those organizations and what that looks like. In other words, you get to talk about money with your kids without talking about assets, because I know for many of you, you don't want to go there. A great way to use this tool is to bring it into the office and have your advisory team sit with you and your kids and let them simply be the facilitator. They'll just pull stories out of you. I will tell you, this will be honestly one of the most enjoyable experiences that you have with your kids. It's fun. It's fun to explain what's important to you. It's fun to tell the stories. The kids will be totally engaged by your stories. And one last thing. I would highly recommend that you allow your kids to choose one charity of their own choice and passion and put it into this family's giving plan, because that's what will attach them to all of this conversation. And then every year when you sit down, you guys will talk about what you're doing, who you're giving to, do you want to change anything and so on and so forth. So this is a wonderful tool for conversations about money. Just honestly, fantastic. Another great tool that I like is this workbook called Family Love Letter. You can buy it at familyloveletter.com. It's about 20 bucks. What's great about this workbook is you can actually put everything your children, let's say your adult children, everything they need to know in this workbook everything. So it's not just, you know, the name of your wealth advisor and your attorney and your accountant and your insurance broker, you know, it's not just that stuff. Let me give you some examples. Did you know that you can gift frequent flyer miles to your kids? There's a section in there, it, cause, and it doesn't have to be in a will, where you just write down. And I would say, give the frequent flyer miles to your grandkids. That's going to feel good to you, and it's going to be an amazing legacy to them when you pass. Another section. Let's just say maybe, you know, you've made a loan to a sister and you didn't happen to mention it to anybody or vice versa. They made a loan to you 
you need to write that stuff down in that particular section. Medical assets. If you've got any medical assets sitting anywhere, what do you want done with them? Do you want them left there for family members or do you want them destroyed? One of my favorite pages is the document locator. It lists all 30 of the most important and most common documents that a family could have. And your only job is to write down where are they? Because for anybody who's ever settled in a state, you know how hard that is. So make it easier. Where are the keys? Where are the passwords? What's an ethical will? Questions for you to answer before you die. All in one place. And again, that's a great conversation tool. You can sit down with your kids and talk about estate planning instead of just money. And then the last idea that I would share with you that's a great one for conversations. If you have a child or a grandchild who's kind of coming of age and they're starting to work, I'll give you an example. Petey's turning 16. Petey wants to save money for a car. He's going to be a lifeguard at the pool all summer long. He's going to make $2,000. And say, I'd like, Petey, since I know that you want to specifically spend that money on a car, I'd like to honor your efforts for your earnings. And I'm going to match what you earn and put $2,000 into a Roth IRA for your future. Bring him into the meeting so that he's part of the whole conversation at the age of 16. Now, your gift to him is not the $2,000. Your gift to him is that he's going to get a statement every year until he's 65 years old that's going to teach him about money, how money and investments change in value, how they fluctuate, and ultimately how they grow is how I like to think. That's your gift to that child. All right, Suzanne, let me bring you into the conversation. Let me ask you a question. What kinds of tools do you like to use? to help your parents raise financially fit kids, again, whether they're eight or they're 40? Sure. So it is really, really important that, you know, you raise children who are financially fit, regardless of the stage of life. And Susan, the story that you told at the jump really resonated with me, starting and being transparent with your children when they're young. So whether that's providing them with an allowance and helping them how, like helping them understand how to manage that money, or even your recent story with PD, where you're matching that Roth contribution. As advisors, we also work very closely with our clients to plan for education expenses. This is a really big piece of the puzzle here. And if your child has a savings account for school, similar to the match with the Roth account, consider matching their savings dollar for dollar as a way to encourage them, while also helping them understand, at the same time, the financial consequences of student loan debt once they graduate from college. Having a financially fit child, again, isn't just making sure that they understand their own finances, but it's ensuring that they understand your finances as you age. Unfortunately, I've seen a number of clients and friends lose loved ones and be completely lost when it comes to next steps. So I can't reiterate enough Susan's point of having your children involved and attend those annual financial reviews that you do with your team so that they do understand and can be a really active participant in, um, in helping to, uh, to leave a legacy for you. Yeah, I, Suzanne, your words resonate for me as well. It's, it's, it's something in the United States we absolutely need to get better at, as both as adult children and as parents to younger kids. All right, here's what we've done. We've talked about some great tools for aging Americans and having those in our family. We've talked about raising financially fit kids. Now let's take five minutes and talk about you, and then I'm happy to take all kinds of questions. Um, what I'd love to do is, is, is to share with you my 33 year perspective on saving and investing successfully and, and essentially give you what I like to call my top 10 list. Um, I'd like to say it's kind of like the David Letterman top 10, but I, I, I need to stop saying that because I kind of date myself when I say that. <laughs> All right, number one, one of the most important strategies I'm gonna share with you is diversification. And you've heard this from your advisors, but it's really, really important. When you look at a chart like this, I do not need you to read it. <laughs> I just want you to look at the colors. <laughs> and the color that gives you the smoothest ride throughout your lifetime of investing is what I like to call the black box. It's kind of dark gray, but it's the black box. And that'll give you the smoothest investment ride over 20 years. And that box, if you could read it, it says diversified. It's a little bit of everything. 
a little bit of big large cap a little bit of mid cap a little bit of value a little bit of growth a little bit of real estate just a little bit of everything so diversify that's one of the most important things you can do dollar cost averaging if you're still in the acquisition stage you've got to be doing dollar cost averaging it's mathematically the only way to actually buy things on sale and increase your wealth number three don't pull out when you're scared everybody wants to pull out including myself when i get nervous about what the market is don't statistically speaking it's better to stick the course and let it ride i'm in this industry i know the stock markets i have a financial advisor i can't pay attention i i, I can't have a full-time job and three kids and an aging mother and pay attention have a plan you've got to have a durable power of attorney a healthcare directive a trust a will a legacy plan have a budget i really i don't care how much money you have you still need to know what your budget is you need to know that's what gives you comfort it's also what empowers you and gives you strength don't support kids if you're a borderline saver it's just not they're grown-ups they need to learn ferret out the needs of aging parents before they surprise you before they surprise you that's crucial and some of the books and tools i gave you will help you do that with just their wordsmithing this is one of my favorites know what your backup plan is so once a year my husband and i sit down in front of the fireplace with a glass of wine it's usually on a rainy night and we play a game called worst case scenario what if one of our parents suddenly needs our financial help what, what does that look like do i take my beautiful cottage office and turn it into an airbnb for my folks god i hope not do i figure out how to fund a retirement home payment for them we play worst case scenario once a year what if one of our three girls boomerangs back home what if one of them gets sick we play that game so that we can financially be prepared for it and if, and then lastly stay educated there's a wonderful website that's available to you that is called lightbulbpress.com lightbulbpress.com it's a website that has compiled about 30 35 different um, brochures <clears throat> on different financial topics so one eight page brochure will be on what is a stock a different brochure will be is what is debt and what is a bond another one will be on what's a variable annuity or what is a donor advised fund in other words concepts in this world of investing I would recommend to you don't buy all 35 at the same time <laughs> just pick one a year go to the website one a year learn a new concept understand they're easy to read they're made for <clears throat> lay people like ourselves use the website to over the next 10 20 years raise your game okay lisa suzanne i'd love to hear from you at this point i'm sure that you've seen your fair share of women put together great financial plans what two to three pieces of advice would you share with this group to achieve their own personal success hmm. well, let me go first uh i think one of the most important aspects that i've seen in achieving personal financial success um, is to use employee benefits to help reach your goals right so if if your employer offers a 401k plan you should consider contributing enough to maximize that employer's match at a minimum. And then every year you should consider increasing that contribution. Um, you know, and, and if you don't have a retirement plan where you work or, or maybe you don't work outside of the home, you need to create your own retirement plan by considering contributing to a traditional IRA or a Roth IRA, or, you know, just to make sure that, you know, as, as you, when you talked about you and your husband in the worst case scenario, you know, uh, every now and then we come across women who find themselves suddenly single and realize like, oh, I don't have my own 401k plan. Or I don't have my own IRA. So, you know, I think it's really important to use those tools that are out there and available to everyone. And I'll jump in too and say, you know, Lisa, I obviously very much agree with you, but I also really recommend thinking about your own goals for the future. Um, what are they? And how can you develop a reasonable 
an actual plan to help you move in the right direction to achieve those goals. So also really important in that is making sure that you have the right investment mix for each goal. You know, as Susan said, diversification is key. And uh, we always joke that old habits die hard, but very rarely should you really be saving for those goals in a savings account at a bank. I would agree. Great advice from both of you. Really great reminders for all of us. Thank you. Um, here's the what we've done today. We've talked about great tools for having aging parents. We've talked about a broad range of tools for trying to raise financially fit kids at different ages. We have talked about what kinds of things we need to be doing well. Work with your financial advisory team. Make sure that you're managing the non-financial risks that can actually impact a retirement plan. And choose from some of the great tools that we've had here today to make you that much stronger. I thank everyone for their time today. Thank you for joining us. Susan, thank you so much for sharing your experiences. We always love to hear from you. And as Lonnie said, if you want to get in touch with me, with Lisa, or your Atlas advisor, just give us a call or send us an email. Our information is in the chat. And I can't thank you guys enough for joining us today. So, and we, I wanted to just make note that we're going to send you a follow-up survey as well. So if you have any constructive feedback or you have an idea for a topic for a future webinar just share that with us too and you know and just remember just like the instructions you get on an airplane to place your own mask on first before helping anybody else you know take care of yourself then take care of others you know that order matters so thanks so much and have a great rest of your day bye everyone bye bye thank you all so much